Angelisi here with Black Doc mm -hmm. for one of many interviews that we've done. We've been talking for a long time now. Yeah, we have. <laughs> <laughs> so I always think, what, what am I going to talk to you about that I haven't talked to you about already? Because we've covered so much ground. Uh -huh. But I did want to mention or talk to you about the fact that your life has sort of come full circle. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you imagine that you started out as a child prodigy, classical pianist, mm -hmm. Performed on every big stage in the world with Rihanna and Justin Timberlake and John Mayer and who else? Mm -hmm. the yeah. list goes Demi Lovato. And now you're a solo classical pianist again. Yeah. Did you ever, especially when you were with them, did you ever think, oh, I'll go back to classical music one day? No way, no how. Really? I had no thoughts of it. Like it was not a thing. It, it just never crossed my mind that I would ever play classical music again. Really? Yeah, I thought I would be in pop and rock and hip hop and every other genre until. Did playing that way challenge you the way classical music does? I mean, did you lose any of your classical chops when you were in that world for a while? Um, I would say I didn't practice as much. Really? Um, the the workload is a little bit simpler, or should I say, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's more about learning how to play this this very simple thing but with the group right you know so learning to play with a group of musicians and play in a very effective way especially pop music because sometimes it's very very simple i think the most challenging uh tour i did was michael jackson immortal playing michael jackson's music mm -hmm. is extremely challenging why it's just more it's more to do it's 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 very uh it's almost as complex as classical music did yeah. that surprise you? I mean, when you had listened to his music, did you pick up on the fact that it was I, I, as complex as you discovered it to be? I knew it had its complexities, but I had no idea it was what it was. Really? Yeah. So how did you go about learning all of it? Well, I had a month um, alone with the music. And with I was with the group, but in like in a separate room learning every day. So my, my schedule would be wake up, go into this practice room and practice all day and learn the show. Um, the very cool thing was that um, my good buddy, Daryl Smith, who I replaced, who uh, he replaced Greg Fillingane. So oh, oh, we're wow. playing okay. what Greg played. So <laughs> That's um, intimidating. it's so intimidating. <laughs> I mean, he's just like, you know, literally the best pianist on the planet, <laughs> right. you know. So um, learning how to play the things that he was playing is is a bit of a challenge because Greg is a fire breathing monster. So, uh, yeah, Michael's stuff is 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 complex. What was it like to be on stage with him? Oh, um, so to be on stage with some of the Michael Jackson musicians like uh, Don Boyette and, mm -hmm. and Sugarfoot and, and uh, uh, John Myron Clark and uh, these guys, it, it was like, you know, you look over and you look at the guys and you go, now, how in the hell did I get here? <laughs> you know? It <laughs> how was did, actually, like, how did you get yeah. here? <laughs> so um, after Greg left the show, uh, Daryl Smith took over. Daryl Smith was going back to tour with Cher, and he needed mm. a replacement. And um, he and my good buddy Kevin Antunes thought that I was the only person that could uh, uh, carry the torch. So I uh, got it employed for Cirque du Soleil to do the last tour, the last year of uh, the Michael Jackson Immortal tour. That's yeah. pretty incredible. Yeah. So then you would go on to work with all of these other artists that we mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, were, were any of those tours as challenging as that one? No. Musically, no. So. Uh, John Mayer was, it was challenging, but in a different way. How so? Um, because it's, it's, it's very jam based. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like being in the garage playing with your homies like back in the day right. for me. So it's very much that same thing. Like he could just, you know, randomly start playing, uh, I don't know, uh, Jimi Hendrix. And then it's just like, okay, we go. We just jam. So, um, and then playing again, I'm on stage with a bunch of musicians, Steve Jordan and, uh, uh, Robbie McIntosh from The Pretenders, and I'm mm -hmm. like, how in the hell did I get here? <laughs> Again, having that those moments. Um, but the cool thing of figuring it out is that, you know, at some point you cross the bridge of, I'm here because I belong here. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, these guys who you have, you know, been your idols for so long right. end up being your friends. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just an amazing feeling. So classical music is very regimented. Mm -hmm. It is played the same way ostensibly mm -hmm. every time mm -hmm. and then you went into a situation where you had to improvise right and a lot of musicians can't do both right was it improvisation did that come easy to you after being classically trained and basically reading things note for note mm -hmm. for so long I would say it didn't 
it didn't come naturally. Um, one of the things that I can always remember, one of our great Detroit jazz legends, uh, Teddy Harris Jr., mm-hmm. was um, my first jazz piano teacher. Right. And he had me come over his house and he gave me this piece he wrote for another uh, Detroit legend, uh, Thomas Beans Bowles. It was a piece mm-hmm. that he wrote for Beans. Right. And uh, it was the first piece that he presented to me. And there was sheet music, but there were also chord changes. Uh. And he said, take this home and learn it, but do it your way. Change things. And that's how they brought me into improvisation was by transitioning me from reading to creating. And um, that's kind of like the catalyst. And then for the next couple of years, I just really dived in. I mean, I went down the rabbit hole, Thelonious Monk, uh, Art Tatum. <laughs> <laughs> I just went down to every jazz musician, every jazz pianist. And uh, that's where the education really started. Would you want to work with? If you hmm. could work with anybody today. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh, there are so I, I at first thought my favorite musician, who is uh, Andreas Voldenweider. Mm-hmm. I would love to work with Andreas. Mm-hmm. Um, have even you ever just, met him? I've never met him. Even just to meet him and sit down and have a conversation would be enough. What about him is so interesting to you? His ability to tell stories with no words. Mm. He's the he's the master storyteller. I mean, to listen to an album of his is like, you know, starting in one country and going around the world and listening to ethnic music from every which direction. And he collaborates with so many musicians from so many different countries and so many different places. And he's able to somehow tell this beautiful story with all these different color palettes. And I think that's one of the most amazing things. Um, and definitely something that inspires me is being able to tell stories. Mm-hmm. So uh, he's the master storyteller. 
I mean, so many, so many of your song titles even mm-hmm. um, would tell us that these are story-driven yeah. pieces of music. Mm-hmm. Um, was that an unexpected way for you to write? I mean, let's get back to Black Book, which mm-hmm. is your first collection of original solo piano works. Mm-hmm. Um, you wrote those songs during the pandemic. Yeah. Right, because you were kind of locked away. Yeah. Um, you had no intention of writing an album like that. No, I, I had never... Uh... The, the big question when I started was, what is my voice? I had never found uh, what my voice was. I knew I know Rihanna's voice. I know Justin's voice. I know John's voice. But I've never sat down and said, if I was to do something authentically mine, what would it be? What would it sound like? So essentially, I just pressed record and, and it just allowed myself the freedom to, you know, go beyond the edge and go beyond the corners and just like experiment with things and it just turned out to be a classical album. <laughs> Did you surprise yourself? Absolutely. I still surprise myself. <laughs> you know, I'm like, am I really doing this? It's still surprising. You and I talked about how you even wrote stuff that was difficult for you to play. Absolutely. Is it still a challenge for you Absolutely. to play some of your music? <laughs> yes, <laughs> very much so. I say all the time, like, why can't I just make it easy? <laughs> like, why do I have to keep doing this to myself? It's like torture. It's terrible. We talked about you being on stage with other people, and now you have to carry the night mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah, are you comfortable in that space yet? Oh yes, yeah. so very comfortable in that space now. I mean, at first it was a little intimidating, uh, but then once you realize that what you're doing is of service and you're helping people, and uh, it just becomes easier to communicate and connect in a very authentic way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're sitting at a piano. Mm-hmm. Whenever you just sit down, do you know what you're going to play? Or did you put your hands on there and then whatever happens? Like, if you put your hands on there now, what would happen? I would probably know what I wanted to play. I I would Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I sit down and go, you know, I just Mm -hmm. let whatever happens happen. And then every once in a while something cool happens, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that was cool. And I try to do it again. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Um, But for them, I know, you know, I know the instrument. So it's like if I want to sit down and play E minor chord, I know exactly what I'm going to do. But... um, even in the writing process, I never step to the piano with, I, I, the, the thought is, think like a child. This is a child, this is child's play. If a kid was going to step up to this piano, what would they do? And then I start there. Yeah, so keeping a child's mind is, is very essential to like the writing process for me. Speaking of kids, mm-hmm. I would guess that you have now developed quite a following of young people mm-hmm. and kids yeah. who look at you as a really cool guy. Yeah playing classical music what does that feel like I'm sure that wasn't your intention no um to start inspiring another generation of classical music lovers but that's certainly what's happened what does that feel like it's awesome it's absolutely awesome I think it's it's so cool that uh they're they're able to look at me as an example of not just classical music but doing it authentically like this is you know he looks you know they say he looks like me Mm-hmm. And I think that's really cool is is they say, you know, it's not, you know, it's not buttoned up and suited up and everything. It's <laughs> yeah. just very cool and relaxed and comfortable. And um, I think to inspire the next generation of not only classical uh, players, but listeners, I think that's the, such an important thing. And um, I am very, very proud to be the torchbearer. And, and if that is what my destiny is, then bring it on. That's a pretty cool role to have. Yeah.
following you on Instagram is quite a joy. Mm -hmm. And watching you put classical accompaniments to popular music today has been a lot of fun to watch. Have you had people whose music you have embellished mm -hmm. reach out to you? Yeah, I have. I've had a couple. Um, it was funny because in the early days, I think one of the first covers I did was by this artist named uh, uh, Guap Dad. And mm -hmm. just so happens he heard it and reposted it. Oh, really? And then uh, Big Frida and a couple others have, have reached out and uh, actually said, you know, this is dope. And they put it on their stories and repost it. And yeah. I've seen you with other musicians, too. Yeah. Cellist, yeah. violinist, I think. Yeah. A couple things. A couple saxophonists, a couple of different friends that, you know, just so happens we're at a certain place and I'm like, eh, let's do a cover. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I've seen people play your music. Mm -hmm. And that has yeah. to be really something to see some of these young people playing your songs, your original songs, mm -hmm. back to you. Yeah. It's absolutely mind numbing. <laughs> is it? <laughs> it's like, any somebody wants to play my music? What is this? What's Can happening? Can you just stop right being now? so surprised? I'm about surprised everything. about everything. <laughs> like, what? This is it wild. But it's the most, it, I honestly, it's the, it's one of the greatest feelings is that you can have something. I mean, when we create, it's something that doesn't exist that we're birthing into the world. And then to have someone else have an appreciation for it and actually want to explore it as well. To me, that is the greatest honor. And when I hear, I mean, I've heard some versions where I'm like, oh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> you know, like the articulation is a little different than I do it. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's always a great thing to hear um, people play my music. And um, I think that that's, like I said, the greatest honor. Sounds like it's good. you're going to be honored for a long time here. I hope so. <laughs>
Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yes. I'm Ann Delisi here with Black Buck here at Rust Belt Studios, WDET Live. Yes. At Rust Belt. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>